driving for Elizabeth's house. So when you're out grocery shopping, buy your toilet paper and paper towels in twos and bring one to donate. All right. Session is meeting tonight at 5. As far as we know, unless somebody cancels out and we don't get a quorum, then we'll send out a text message to you. We're prepared for session to meet at 5. Bar nothing coming up. All right. Wednesday, we will continue on with our disciple making, Disciples Making Disciples Bible Study with the Madisonville Church via Zoom at and just as a reminder, next Sunday is Father's Day. You have been warned. <laughs> we want to welcome everybody um, that's here at the church and everybody that's going to be um, watching this on Facebook. We're glad that you're joining in and worshiping with us. Thank you so much. We are um, getting into the summer season and getting the change of the seasons and it's you know um it, it's good it makes me re remember or think about that with a god um god is always there and things are always going to get better we are in um i think a, a really good phase in our country we're beginning to open up and and that's a big thing so just remember that God is with us always. Mm -hmm. And because he's with us always, he's worthy of our worship. And that's what we're doing here today is worshiping our God. Amen. Ma'am. All right, if you're able, stand with me. Number 65. Hold to God's unchanging hand. Number 65. <laughs> Oh. 
worship with a reading from God's Word. In Micah chapter 6 and verse 8 it says, He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? To act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Let us pray. Precious Heavenly Father, as we gather once again to lift up our voices and our hearts in worship, Lord, we pray that you find the worship of our souls pleasing unto you, a fragrant incense burning ever before. And Lord, be with us as we go through this service. Lord, we ask that you would open our hearts and our minds to the things you would have us to know and to do. And Lord, give us the courage to go out and do them. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Right. Now, a little more praise singing. Onward to number 67. Blessed be the name. 67. <clears throat> Thank you. 
by week since the entire last half. <laughs> this morning, let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, we come before you this morning, thankful for the nourishing rain that you are sending us, sending our crops, sending to our farmers. Lord, this morning, we ask that you are here with us. We ask that your spirit be here with us, that your angels will be worshiping with us today. God, just excite us, ignite that fire within us so that when we leave here, we go and spread that to others, that we share your word with those we come into contact with, that we share your love that you have given us. Father, this morning I pray as we read your word and we understand your message to open our hearts and our minds to receive what you have prepared. And Lord, I pray that every word from my mouth is yours and not mine. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35. We're going to read through 10 8 this morning. It says this. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And he called to him his twelve disciples, and he gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to Heal every disease and every affliction. The name of the twelve apostles are these. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. Philip and Bartholomew. Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus. Simon, the zealot and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out, instructing them, Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, raise the dead, Cleanse lepers, cast out demons. You received without paying, give without pay. Amen. When I first read the scripture this week, I was struck, first of all, by verse 36, where Matthew says that they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. And Jesus, coming upon this and seeing the scene, he had compassion for these people. And he proceeds to tell his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. This struck me, and 
And I had to stop and ask God, why? Why were these people so helpless? Why were the laborers so few? Now, why is a funny question to ask. And if you've ever been around kids, <laughs> you know it's their favorite question to ask, right? Especially the real little ones. Why? 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 You finally get frustrated. You're like, because I said so, that's why. Just go with it. And like these small children, I have to be honest, at times asking the question, why has gotten me into trouble? That may be why I'm not in a certain denomination anymore which will remain nameless. Because I like to ask why until I get to the bottom of the question. Now let me share with you a quick story about understanding this question of why. There was a young, newly married woman. She was at home with her husband one evening, and she was going to cook a ham in the oven for supper. She pulled out this beautiful large ham out of the refrigerator and she proceeded to cut off both ends of the ham. She then placed this ham in the roasting pan and put it in the oven. And her husband, who is not a cook, but having never seen this particular method of making a ham before, uh, finally mustered up the courage and he asked his young bride, Honey, why do you cut off the ends of the ham before you cook it? She said, Well, that's how my mother always made it. Now this seemed a satisfactory answer to the young man and he went about eating his supper. But this question began turning inside of the young woman. So the next day she went to visit her mother. And she stepped into her childhood kitchen and she sat there and she asked her mom, Mom, why is it when you cook a ham that you cut off the ends of it before you put it in the oven? Her mother thought about this for a moment and she said, Well, that's how my mother always cooked it. So, here we go again. You see, the question of why has been answered, but only to a certain degree. We haven't got to the root of the issue. Her mother did indeed give her all the information that she had available to her, but there's still a level of it not answered. So the young woman that weekend, she decided she was going to go visit her grandmother. She sat down with her grandmother in her kitchen with a cup of coffee and conversation, and the young woman said, Grandmother, why is it that when you cook a ham, you cut the ends off before you put it in the oven? grandmother slowly walked over, picked up her roasting pan, looked at it, looked at her granddaughter, and she said, well, honey, the hands are too big to fit in the pan. <laughs> there we have it. The answer to Sometimes the answer that we're looking for is not immediate. And often we need to keep asking to get to the true answer. Often things in our culture, in our personal context, are just a repeated theme or action that we have done. Many times it began as a legitimate need, something as silly as even cutting off the ends of your ham. But if we don't ask that question, why? We're never going to know the real reason that something is being done or is not being done. So when I ask the question why, specifically in moments of why do we do, or why does this have to be done, you fill in the blank. I'm sure you've asked this question a million times yourself. The most common answer I receive is, well, we've always done it that way, right? I have found this to be true in kitchens, in companies, in civic organizations that I've been involved in, and in church. The answer that I'm looking for, though, is usually much deeper than just that surface. Well, we've always done it this way. 
And it requires us to look beyond that point to truly understand the why. So here in this context of our scripture, I ask God, why were they helpless and harassed? The easy answer, the surface answer, is that they were confused and living in a chaotic time. But the deeper understanding requires us to look back at this people group to see what more was going on. We see here that Jesus is specifically speaking to the Jews. And when he sends out those 12 apostles, they are sent only to the lost people of Israel. The good news was not yet being extended to the entire world. So what was going on? Well, we have to remember that these Jews were attempting to live up to the Levitical laws. Those lovely rules and regulations that their nation called them to follow. And these laws were rigid. And they kept adding more and more of them. Another thing that was going on was Roman occupation. Now, no one liked the Romans. And as a Jew... You were already subject to a temple tax and all the offerings and sacrifices that had to be made there. But now you have to add on a Roman tax and the Roman laws that you needed to abide by. Then along comes this brand new thing. This guy named Jesus shows up. He starts doing all this really crazy stuff that you're hearing about. A whole lot of it that you probably don't really believe, but you're curious. I mean... You hear about blind people receiving their sight, lepers being instantly healed, lame men just getting up, taking their mat, and walking away, raising people from the dead. I mean, come on, seriously, what all have you been smoking? This is really happening. So God answered me my why. These, these people were hemmed in on every side and confused beyond belief. Roman oppression, legalistic laws that no one could keep, and now Jesus? What do you believe? Who do you follow? What is the right thing to do? Confusion and chaos. Matthew says that Jesus had compassion Compassion. Recognizing the fact that they didn't know what to do. They were harassed and helpless. Recognizing that what needed to be done at this time of confusion and chaos was they needed a shepherd. They needed someone to show them the way. Now let's talk about this whole shepherding thing. I like shepherds. Shepherding is one of the oldest professions in the world. But shepherding is not historically or culturally recognized as a very glamorous job. It was usually the bottom of the totem pole position of life. And yet they were and are an integral part of the system. I mean, this was food for the people that they were watching over. This was animals for the sacrifices that was made in the tabernacle and the temple. And yet these shepherds were not well thought of. The mentality towards these folks was that they were subpar, right? They were less intelligent, untrustworthy, thieves, liars, and cheats. Hmm. Knowing that that's what shepherds were thought of, it makes you look at characters from scripture in a completely different light. I mean, think for a moment of some of the famous shepherds that you can think of. Abraham. David. Moses. Those are the ones that I can think of off the top of my head. But what about that famous scene that we have? where peace on earth was declared by an angel army. That message was given to who? Shepherds. The lowliest of individuals. 
individuals, these scum of the earth. These people brought the most important messages to humankind. They were the deliverers. And here in our scripture today, we have the greatest shepherd of all, compassionate for these confused, harassed, helpless people because they're lost without a leader. Here too, I ask God, why? Why was there no one there to lead them? The answer that I need to share with you comes from an article that God led me to. This article is titled, 10 Things I've Learned from Lambs. And it's written by Craig Rogers. In this article, he lists off, not surprisingly, 10 things. But it was this third item that really stuck out to me. The subheading is, tend to the flock, but care for the individual. In it, Roger says this. Shepherds, like the sheep themselves, learn quickly that the path to success depends on tending to the flock, but caring for the individual. Providing clean water, ample forage, and shelter to an entire flock is essential to maintaining the health of the flock. But the success of a shepherd or shepherdess is in the compassion they have for each individual. This means being able to identify a sick or injured sheep or lamb within a flock of hundreds or thousands of sheep, assisting with the birth of a lamb when needed, caring for a lamb orphaned by its mother, providing the expected mother with enhanced nutrition, or weaning a lamb in a compassionate manner are all part of that job. The more concern the shepherd has for the individuals who are in need of health care, supplemental food assistance, or individual attention, the healthier the flock and more profitable the whole operation is. He says this lesson applies to more than a flock of sheep. Several years ago, one of my best friends inherited a farm after her mother passed away. And with this inheritance, she also received 300 head of sheep. Cute little lambs, right? Mm -mm. Not so much. Now, I knew exactly nothing about taking care of sheep. And guess what? She knew exactly nothing about taking care of sheep. And you can see the problem that we found ourselves in, right? So being the friend that I am, and because I happened to work for the University of Kentucky Extension Service at the time, I called the shepherd. And I said, hey, we know nothing about sheep. She's got 300 head. Would you mind spending the day with us and teaching us everything that you know? He said, sure. We said, great. So we scheduled the day and we went down and we spent the entire day with this man. And he taught us everything that he knew and everything that he could about sheep, how to take care of them, diseases, what to look for, now, I shouldn't have to tell you that the day spent with this gentleman was rewarding, but extremely exhausting. There's so much to know. Like Craig Rogers' article pointed out, maintaining the health of the flock is one thing, but you have to look at the individual sheep, and that requires so much more. You have to look for limps. Maybe there's something wrong with its hoof. What if the sheep is losing weight, has a body mass loss? What does that mean? What if they're not eating? What do you do? How do you know when they're ready to give birth? Which, by the way, is always in the coldest months, in the middle of the night. These are all things that you have to pay attention to when you have sheep. 
Raising sheep is a whole lot more than just opening a gate and letting them go. It requires a lot of hard work. And it was here that God brought me back to my question. Why didn't they have a shepherd? Why was there not a leader? The answer was because no one was willing to put in the time and the effort necessary to be the shepherd. The religious leaders were only interested in telling the people what they weren't doing right and how amazing they themselves were. The Roman oppressors were only interested in maintaining the status quo and making sure that they paid their taxes so that they could continue expanding their empire. Then along comes Jesus, who spent countless hours with these people. Not like the religious leaders of the day pointing out all of their flaws, but by building a relationship with them. Meeting them right where they were. Oh, you have a limp? Hang on, let's fix that leg. What? You're thirsty? I've got water that's never going to run dry. Your sins? Well, go and sin no more, because they're forgiven. And each miracle, each fix, each relationship building exercise, those lost, confused, scattered sheep started talking to each other, and bringing each other home, restoring the health of the flock. One connection at a time. Being a shepherd is time consuming. It is a commitment. The reason these people did not have a shepherd is because no one was willing to put in the time. Jesus tells his disciples that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Because being a shepherd, being a laborer, being a disciple maker, it takes time. It takes effort. And it takes commitment. Everyone wanted the glory, but no one wanted to do the work. Kind of reminds me of the little red hen. So, where am I going with all of this rambling on? Okay. The truth of the matter is that we're in the same situation today. We have a whole lot of people in this world that want to see their names in line, but they aren't willing to put in the time and the effort to develop the relationships that are necessary to maintain the health and the direction of the flock. I recently had someone point out to me all these people that sit at home that aren't connected to a local church, but they watch all these preachers online. Who's going to do your funeral? You're going to call Joel Osteen? Is he going to come down and preach that for you because you watch him every Sunday? Who's going to marry your kids? Who's going to baptize your grandchildren? You're going to call one of them because they're going to leave what they've got going on because you religiously pay attention? You should be connected to our local church because not only do you have a shepherd, but you shepherd each other. We have a whole lot of people in this world looking for that quick fix. They want to jump in, put a patch on the problem, but never ask the question of why. Why is there this problem to begin with? Brothers and sisters, we need to ask why. And keep asking why. Hopefully not quite as annoying as a three-year-old. But we still need to ask why. We need to get to the root of the issue. We need to understand that being a shepherd requires our time and our commitment. That it's about developing relationships and having compassion. That it's hard work. That it can be and will be on some days exhausting, frustrating, but that there will be more days that are rewarding and fulfilling. We need to 
to recognize who our true shepherd is. Jesus Christ. And then understand that just like the 12 apostles, that we too have been sent out as under shepherds, taking care of our own flocks, leading the people and the communities that we have been granted care of. We're each a shepherd in our own way. So today I leave you with this charge. Go. Make disciples of all nations, shepherding the ones that are in your care, leading them, loving them, having compassion for them, right where they are. Showing them by example the great love of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For the harvest is truly coming. Amen. Amen. Let us sing. with me and turn to number 14. Love lifted me. Number 14. like to give, there is a collection plate in the vestibule, or you can give online through Tithely. Hit me up if you need the address for that. Today's offertory sentence comes from Psalm 27 and verse 14. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Yes, wait for the Lord. And if you'll stand with me, we will do the doxology.
And may may the peace of Christ be with you. And may the peace of Christ be with you. May the peace, peace of Christ, of Christ be, with be with you. May the peace be with you always. In Jesus Christ, we pray. I tell you, one of these days, and we're going to go back to shaking hands and hugs. Let's see, I have no intention of learning how to do that right. None.